Good morning. My name is Lynn Evans and I'm the director of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Delaware. I'd like to welcome all of you today for the second in our series, Trailblazers and Changemakers. We are so pleased to bring you the stories of exceptional women. And you'll see today why it is so important that they are now controlling the narrative and telling their own stories. Last week, we kicked off the series with Zita Cobb. And if you weren't able to attend, I would highly recommend that you go back and listen to the replay. Um, all of our replays are available online and are free and can be utilized for facilitated discussions. So if you or a group with which you are affiliated would like to um, use some of these webinars, please reach out to us. Right now, we are working with a lot of employee resource groups and using the webinars and amplifying those messages within organizations. This is a list of our upcoming webinars. I hope that you will be able to, uh, to join us. They are going to be um, as exciting as I expect today will be as well. We'd like to uh, pause now and big, uh, give a big thank you to our sponsors. Um, without these sponsors, it would be difficult to bring um, the webinars to you free, and we are very happy to do so. So special thanks to our UD sponsor, PNC. We thank them for their work in diversity and inclusion and for the support of our efforts. We're also grateful for the support of Barclays, Delaware Today, Investnet, and Wawa. If you or a, your organization would like to sponsor us, please reach out and let us know. Or if you would like to support any of the activities of the Women's Leadership Initiative, please contact us at the website that you see at the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to take a moment and highlight the Women's Leadership Initiative online certificate program. The inaugural cohort was launched last month in February and was created because we had to put on pause our in-person leadership forum, Rise Up. And we certainly hope to resume that series when it is safe again to meet in person. But because of the demand by women for this type of training, we created an online version. The inaugural cohort sold out very, very quickly. So we've added another beginning April 30th and running through May and June. If you are looking to advance in your career, if you are looking to change careers, I would highly recommend that you look into this program and add it to your career plan. And just as a reminder, today we are using Zoom webinar. So you can see and hear us but we cannot see or hear you. But we encourage you as always to put your questions, your comments, resources into the chat. We love interacting with everyone in the chat room and I promise we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We are also live tweeting today. Uh, and if you are as well, um, we'd appreciate that you tag us at UD Women Lead. Um, we are using the hashtag trailblazing women. And for the conversation today, we're using the hashtag Cassandra Speaks. And now I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our guest today, Elizabeth Lesser. Elizabeth is a best selling author and a co founder of the Omega Institute, which is a retreat and conference center located in Rhinebeck, New York. Elizabeth is known globally for her work in wellness, creativity, spirituality, and social change. Um, she has worked for Oprah and is in fact one of Oprah's Super Soul 100. And that's a collection of 100 leaders who are using their talents and their voice to um, elevate humanity. Her latest book and the topic today is Cassandra Speaks. When women are the storytellers, the human story changes. It's just a remarkable book and it reveals how humanity has outgrown its origin stories, its hero myths, and empowers women to trust their own instincts, 
find their voice and tell new guiding stories. In fact, we are going to raffle off a signed copy of Cassandra Speaks, and I will make the announcement of the winner um, at, by the end of the hour. So Elizabeth, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. Hi. <laughs> there you are, good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's great everyone. to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Um, as I just said, and I'm gonna repeat it again, this is an amazing book. I'm just gonna hold it up, I don't know, there we go. It's hard to see it in that disembodied part of the uh, Zoom background. Um, and I just want to say that um, I, have, I have to admit, so many of the concepts in this book, I had never thought of, thought about. I'm not sure that I was even aware of them. That's what was um, so remarkable for me. And it wasn't until I read the book that I realized the impact on every part of our society of the, the male story, um, of the patriarchy of, of our society. So I wanted to lead off the, the, um, the, the webinar here with what is it that was your inspiration? Was it an aha moment or a culmination of uh, many moments? I'd say it was both. And anyone who's written knows what I mean by that. Um, a book, especially an, uh, a, a nonfiction book about a, a topic like this, it's, it's almost like a, a storm growing out at sea. And it's been, it's been building for a long time. And then the wave crests. I mean, I was um, and am uh, the child of a very domineering father and a kind of very smart, pissed off mother and four daughters. And it was a very female household. My grandmother and great aunt lived with us also. There were all these women, one man, and he called the shots. Whatever he wanted to do, whatever his value system was, that was ours. Now he was a cool guy and he had some great values, but no one got to say what we wanted to do. And for some reason, I really don't know why, uh, I was the one of the four girls who butted up against him and and said, wait a minute, this isn't fair. You know, I just finished reading Isabel Allende's beautiful book, The Soul of a Woman. And she's, her opening line of the book is something like, when I say I was a feminist in kindergarten, I'm not exaggerating. And I, I was like that myself. I was just always looking at my family, at my culture and saying, wait a second, why? Why don't women get to strut our stuff, our values, what we want? Why is there this sense of shame about being a woman and using our voice? And so throughout my life, I have asked those questions. And at Omega Institute, I, I curated a conference um, probably 20 years ago because I realized I was so uncomfortable using the word women and power together. Like, like as women, we're not supposed to want power. We actually do want it. So we try to get it through the back door. But I thought, who are some women who are just boldly saying, I'm gonna exercise my power. So I invited a few women to this first class. I invited Anita Hill, who was 20 years ago, still kind of like, uh, in the zeitgeist of American culture. And I invited Eve Ensler, who wrote the Vagina Monologues and Iana Van Zandt, a few women like that. And I thought maybe 50 people would come and that would be it. Well, hundreds came. And so we did it again and again. One, the third year we did it in New York City and 2000 women came from around the world. And we've done it ever since this conference called Women and Power. And I would give the keynote at every speech, at every conference. And at one point, my daughter-in-law said to me, you ought to take all those keynote speeches and create them into a book. And I thought, well, that sounds easy. Well, of course it wasn't easy. No books are easy, but that was the genesis of the book. Um, this conference that I was trying to turn into a body of work 
and also being a feminist since I was in kindergarten. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you talked about the stories of the women that you wanted to tell, but you start this book with the stories of, of mythology, of the Bible, um, which I love as you set the stage for the early stories of women and of all of them that you talk about in, in the early part of the book, um, what is it about Cassandra that spoke to you and, and, and therefore became the title of your book? Yeah, you're right. I, I tell, I retell, I tell and retell the story of Eve, Adam and Eve and our, our, our origin sister and Pandora and lots of women from literature but Cassandra became the book's title. I didn't plan it that way. Um, I tell a story at the begin very beginning of the book, uh, how one speaker at Omega at a very different conference years and years ago, this was when Cassandra first started whispering to me. I didn't know the story or maybe vaguely, and maybe all of you vaguely know the story of Cassandra, but this woman who was part of a conference on um, mythology, she saw me in, in Omega's faculty dining room and she kind of went like this to me, brought me over to her table. She was one of these people that, she was a wise woman. If like the old stories were telling it, they'd say she was a witch or a hag, but she was this wise woman. She brought me over. She was a classics professor at a noted university. And she asked me, what's wrong? She like kind of saw into me. And you know, those kind of people can make you really uncomfortable. Like, hey, leave me alone, I'm just having lunch. But I ended up telling her how I had just come out of a meeting and it was a meeting like so many meetings where I had great ideas. All my co-leaders were men but no one really listened to me. And the more I tried to get my ideas and values across and my priorities for our organization, the more I felt like I was whining and complaining. And she said, do you know the story of Cassandra? She told me the story. Cassandra was the princess of uh, the daughter, the most beautiful princess in all, in all of ancient Greece from the city of Troy. And everyone wanted to woo her, including the gods. Now, this is a story. Remember, this is a myth, just like Adam and Eve and all of the old stories. Someone told these stories. I, I need to just kind of interrupt the story of Cassandra just to remind us, like the historian um, Sally Roche Wagner says, history isn't what happened. It's who tells the story. And all of our old stories were told by men because those were the storytellers. And it's just important to remember that because the values of the old stories stick to us. They become our culture. So this story about Cassandra was cooked up by men, but it has stuck to us. Cassandra didn't want to get married. She wanted to devote her, her life to spiritual search. She wanted to, in those days, I don't know what it was called, but she wanted to serve the gods but the men all wooed her, including Apollo, son of Zeus. And Apollo said to her, I'm gonna give you a gift, Cassandra. And this gift is you will be clairvoyant. You will see into the future. You will know what's gonna happen, all the good things and all the bad things, and you will warn the people and they will believe you and you will change history. And she wanted that because she wanted to do well by her people. But he didn't tell her that if he gave her the gift, then she'd have to sleep with him right then and there and become his concubine. So she accepted the gift. And then when she refused to sleep with him, to have sex with him, he cursed her. He said, Cassandra, you still will see the future and you still will tell what's gonna happen. You will know it in your bones. No one will believe you. That's the curse. You will know the truth, you will say, and no one will believe you. And of course she did see the truth. She foretold the Trojan war. She saw her family all dead in the burning flames of the city and she would say this and people called her crazy. It was sort of like the first incident of gaslighting where she knew what was happening, but she was led to believe she was crazy for knowing it and saying it. 
So as I was writing the book, and as you say, looking at all the old stories, I was also paying attention to what was going on in the world. And it was the beginning of the Me Too movement. And uh, they were televising the trial of Dr. Larry Nasser, who had, um, under the guise of treating these young athletes, uh, mostly gymnasts for universities and the Olympic Committee, he had been molesting them, sexually molesting hundreds and hundreds of girls over 30 years. And these girls told their parents and some of them told their universities and some of them went all the way to the Olympic Committee, but no one believed them. They took the word of one man over hundreds of girls telling the same story, except this one woman, Judge Rosemary Aquilina, who took their case and tried Dr. Nasser and found him guilty and, and he went to jail for it. But he, he, she, she changed the rules of, court, of the courtroom. Mm -hmm. She allowed 125 of these girls to testify, tell their story, and they were believed. So that's why I called the book Cassandra Speaks. That's just a great story. And when I think about the, the young women uh, that testified um, and their story and their perspective, you know, they, they had a, a commonality a, a, a around their experiences, bad one at that. Um, but, you know, this is maybe a good time to level set um, your perspective or, you know, or for that matter, our perspective. So I find it interesting that, you know, your work is acknowledging and amplifying the work of women, but women as a group. Um, and, and you, you know better than any of us that we're not a monolithic group. Society likes to put us there. Um, but as you and I sit here this morning, I'm fairly confident that based on our, uh, our gender, uh, generation, our ethnicity, we probably have a lot of the shared experiences and therefore perspectives. But I would love to hear you comment on the, the work you do to, to amplify all women, and yet in, in the concept and in the world of intersectionality right. and massive differences in our shared experiences of, of women. I am so grateful you're, you're asking that. That's such an important question and it's such an important question to lead up top with. Um, I was so haunted by that question. Like I have a particular lane in which I have lived and worked and been privileged. And um, even though I have allowed myself to be schooled by women younger than I am from, a, from different countries, from different backgrounds, different races, and have, you know, it's almost been a prayer, teach me how many varied stories there are out there. Even so, I see things through my lens. That's just what we all do, even though we commit to being more open. And I was so haunted by my own um, myopia, myopia that I almost didn't write the book. At one, at one moment, I even asked to have my um, advance from the publisher given back to me because I was like so aware that I was not necessarily going to do justice to intersectionality. And for those listening who aren't familiar with the word, all it means is that even in a topic as broad as women, there are so many streams coming into this topic, your race, your financial background, your country, your generation, all of these intersect and make the topic different for everyone. And we have to always be aware of that. So I'd have on my shoulder this critic saying, you don't know enough about this or that. It's hard enough to write a book. The critics are always there. So I let it be known in the introduction of this book that like I am speaking through one lens. And if you don't feel yourself in my perspective, that's okay. And I, I hope you will honor your perspective as you're reading. And 
the thing that gave me the most um, courage to go ahead and publish the book was right before the book was ready to be handed in, I gave a, a speech at one of our conferences, our Women in Power conferences, and the speaker who came after me was Tarana Burke, the founder of the Me Too movement. And uh, Tarana is a formidable character. And I was so pleased she was there. And before she came on, I gave my speech and it was about the Cassandra story. I told the Cassandra story and I told it in context of the Me Too movement so that it was an on-ramp for Tarana. And then after Tarana gave her talk, I was backstage waiting for her and she got off stage and she took my hands and looked into my eyes and she said, that speech is so important for everybody. And I thought, okay, thank you, Ms. Burke. You just gave me the courage to know that it would speak to everyone, even though we all have different takes on this subject. I, I'd love to hear that because I think that um, particularly now we are holding ourselves back. I mean, all different people, um, ethnicities, like we are not empowered to comment because we don't have that experience, but yet if we don't, we're not having those conversations. Um, so they might not be the right conversation and it might be the wrong verbiage, but I, it's interesting to, for me to hear you say that you were, were nervous about that, that Absolutely. you were fearful um, of, of, of being outside of your lane, but maybe that's where the problem has been all along is that we've tried to stay I, in our lane. It's okay to be fearful. I think it's okay because I think it's a sign that we're, especially those of us who have been privileged to live in a certain lane of, of validity and power in a culture, it's good to feel that nervousness. It's good to be like, am I in being inclusive enough? Am I handing the mic over enough? Right. A am I finally being part of a tremendous transformation of our culture. So it's a fine line between being nervous about it and as you say, silencing ourselves. I don't think anyone wants us to be silenced. For me, you know what's worked the best in, in dealing with this? It's making sure I have friends of all different backgrounds, making sure that I have proximity in my life to women of color, to women with disabilities, women of all different sexualities. It's like, it's time for us so that I can say, hey, friend, what, what do you think about this? And that's made all the difference in my life. That's great. That's terrific insight. Um, it's not to be fearful. I'm gonna remember that because it does inhibit uh, uh, oftentimes that communication, um, the, the fear of, of um, rebuke, um, yeah. that you're wrong. Um, and that's okay too, right? To, yeah. to, to be wrong. we are wrong. Yeah. Right, <laughs> and usually <laughs> we are. <laughs> um, I wanna go back to the book um, for a moment and a quote that really struck me, and I've, I've written it down here. It was from the Spanish philosopher, Jose Ortega y Gasset, and, um, you repeat this a few times in this particular chapter. It says, tell me to what you pay attention and I will tell you who you are. And I, from that, you gave examples of in our society or collective societies, what we're paying attention to, whether they're ideas or, or physical things. And, and for me, that was the way that I started to think about, oh my gosh, I am surrounded by this and I don't know, or I don't know the impact. Can you give some examples? Sure. Yeah, I love that quote also. Tell me to what you pay attention and I will tell you who you are. Not just as an individual, I will tell you what your culture is all about. And I became really aware of that idea. One day I was walking through Central Park. This was back when we could walk through Central Park without a mask and far away from people. Oh, may that day come back. But I was walking through Central Park and I became aware of a statue um, 
at the entrance to the park where I often enter the park. And it's a statue of um, about eight or nine young soldiers from World War I. And they're holding their bloody comrade in their arms. And you see the blood and, and the pain on their faces. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting, a war memorial. And I decided to walk through the park and try to find every statue. At when this became something, not just that day, I did it over several days. And there's something like, I think 60 statues in the park. And um, I noticed, and then I did some research about it, that only four of them were statues of real life women, or maybe two were statues of real life women. And the rest were like Mother Goose and, um, Alice in Wonderland and things like that, or angels. And of all those statues of men, most of them were of war. Generals, uh, General Sherman sitting on a horse. Who was General Sherman, I thought. I looked him up. Not only did he like, quote unquote, liberate uh, the South from the Confederacy, he also burned down the entire city of Atlanta on his way out of town and other scorched earth kind of behavior. He also was the person who created Native American um, uh, reservations. And in order to get Native Americans onto the reservations, he killed all of the living buffalo so that they had nothing to eat and they would starve. I'm like, this is the guy who sits enormous at the start of Central Park on a golden horse. This is, why are we honoring him? Why that statue? Why that? And all over the world, whether it's Washington, D.C., or, or Russia, or Cambodia, or France and Paris, everywhere, all the statues we pay attention to are war memorials, or soldiers, or generals. And I thought, why are we paying attention to this? And it led me to think about what we learn in history as children. And I always used to think as a kid, why do I have to memorize the dates of these battles? Like, I'm not interested in this. Why do I have to know what happened in the wars all the way back and back and back into the Greek wars and American wars and European wars? Why is that history? And remember that quote from Sally Roche Wagner, history isn't what happened, it's who tells the story. Who made those statues? Who determined that all we learn about is men in adventures and war? What about a statue, let's say, of a woman delivering a child? Like, that's an experience more than 50% of the world has. Is it gory and painful and sometimes bloody? Yeah, but so were those soldiers in Central Park holding their bloody comrades. Why do we only memorize the dates of battles? What about memorize, what, what were the women doing? What were other people doing? What, what were people cooking? What were, how were they raising their children? What was going on in art and and in daily life, why isn't that history? And many a language is another thing to pay attention to. Everything is from the, advantage, the vantage point of who told the story, but that does not mean it's the only thing that was happening, nor does it mean that's just the way humans are. That's just the way the story has been told. Right. And so when you say language, you're talking about um, novels, the, the, the classics. I know you have a part in, in uh, the book where you talk about um, if you look up the top 10 or 20 um, classics of all time, there might be Wuthering Heights in there. Um, and that would be the lone female author. And I hadn't thought about that. You know, what is recommended in high schools? In, in what are we still reading in high schools? Um, not that they aren't great novels, but they are a perspective. You know, as we were talking about earlier, right? It's just that perspective. Um, I also thought it was uh, really enlightening to think about the language we use every day. 
you know, can you comment on that? Because that was something that had never occurred to me as well. Yeah, expressions. It hadn't really occurred to me that much either. But um, if any of you are planning on writing a book <laughs> or even a thesis, the minute you pick something, you just begin to see it everywhere. So you become a sponge and you're looking everywhere and everything is telling you a story. And I was in the airport um, after 9-11 and this was just a few days after 9-11, I had to go somewhere. And this is when I first began paying attention to the roots of our language. And, I be, and then I later used it in, in the book. I, I was helping a young mom who had a toddler who, you know what happens when toddlers, they're, they're fine, they're fine. And then all of a sudden they melt down and you've got a screaming mess on your hands. And I was helping this woman try to fold up her stroller and get all of her stuff. And I was holding on to the baby who was crying. And I said to the young mom, children are like time bombs. And suddenly the um, TSA officials came and took me away and said, come with me, ma'am. I was like, what's going on? They had heard me say the word time bomb. And they were so sensitive at that moment to anything that had to do with a bomb on an airplane that they had to check everything, my body and my bags and everything. I was very compassionate toward them, even though it seemed a little ridiculous, but it made me think, why did I use the word time bomb? Mm -hmm. Why did I call a little baby a time bomb? And I began to look at lots of the language we use words like heavy hitter, low blow, no holds barred. That one, I, I was, I used that one a lot. No holds barred. I love this. No holds barred. I am interested in this. No holds barred. I was like, what does that even mean? I had no idea what it meant, where it came from, how you spelled it. It just was like, no holds barred. I looked it up. It is a wrestling term. And it comes from the ancient Greek where wrestling or Roman, I think Rome, um, they began to make rules about wrestling before the rules, any hold in wrestling was not barred. So you could absolutely kill someone even in a match because there, and they would sometimes say this match is no holds barred. And I thought, why do I use that phrase, no holds barred, when I'm talking about something I love? And I began to think every time I would use words like, that's a heavy hitter, or, or he's a straight shooter, I, I would think, wait a second, without being, you know, I don't, I don't think we should police each other's language and humor is great. But I began to think there's got to be other words for this, like cooking words or gardening words. And one day I was getting off the phone with one of my favorite human beings. She's a nun, Sister Joan Chittister. Some of you may have read her books, and if you haven't, you should. She's an incredible, powerful, brave nun who has stood up to the Vatican on lots of different issues. And I said to her, Sister Joan, you are so kick ass. And she said to me, oh dear, don't call me kick-ass. Call me Levin. I thought, Levin, what Levin, what is Levin? I looked it up. It's the rising agent in bread. She wanted me to call her something that helps people rise up. And she said to me, you are Levin, dear. You are Levin. And I now call my friends or people I know when I want to say, man, you're kick-ass. And sometimes I do say kick-ass, but most of the time, the people I'm talking about are not kicking anybody's ass. They are helping people rise. So I say, you are Levin. Well, you know, it's funny um, that you should say that. We had a strategy meeting um, with our women's leadership team and I caught myself mid-sentence um, because I've read your book, because I was going to say, I started to say, I'm not ready to pull the trigger on implementing this program. 
And I stopped. And um, having the team having met you, Wendy Smith suggested that I say, uh, I'm not ready to bake that cake yet. And I said, indeed, that's what I will use. And, you know, so we now are catching ourselves, um, you know, and, and I, I came from a, a background in portfolio management, you know, male dominated and very much about power and very much about um, victory, zero sum, you know, and that's what you would do for a trade is you would pull the trigger or, you know, you, it, was, it was very violent. I had no idea. One, one thing to think about, you know, like when you said, I'm not ready to bake that cake. I want us not just to use it because it's kind of a fun, cute exercise, but like, I want to dignify baking a cake. Like, why is pulling a trigger virile and important and full of power? I want to baking a cake and planting a seed, not to be some sort of adorable girly thing. I want it to have clout and power. I want it to be valid. Baking that cake, feeding people, growing food, tending. I want that to be heroic. Right, well said, well said. You know, I want to switch gears for a moment because the real meat of the, there's an expression, but that's an okay one, I guess. Say the real tofu. No, there, yeah, exactly. This is great. The soy of, <laughs> of the book um, is doing power differently. This it was a terrific part of the book. And I think something that women struggle with, and you alluded to this at the, when, at the beginning of the webinar, is that word power. And you acknowledge that it's a bad word for a lot of women of it, you know, as, as in power corrupts, we don't want power and you don't view it as a negative term. And can, can you expand on that a bit? Yeah. Um, everyone wants power. If you define power in, in the way I define power or the way if you think about it, you might want to define power. Power is a story also and power has been defined over the ages. And there's actual books all the way back to ancient China, Sun Tzu, the, the art of war is really like the first definition of what power and what leadership means. And it's all associated with war and strategy and power over and domination and fear. And this is how power has been defined but there's other kinds of power. And I define power as this urge in us to shine, to bring our best self out, to lead, to make a difference, to uh, sing our song, the song we were given to sing. And you need power for that because often there's um, sticks in the river that you need to clean out and get out of the way. How do we create our lane where we are free to be ourselves and to express ourselves. When obstacles arise, what do we do with it? Well, the answer in the old power has been, you shoot it, you pull the trigger, you dominate it, you make the other people serve you. There are other ways for us to sing our song. I mean, you may remember back when we first met and I met your team, I was so so moved by, I, by the way I saw all of you interacting. One person spoke, everyone else gave them room and then praised them or commented and in, in a way that was helpful. It was like, wow, this is doing power differently. Do you remember that? I do. And I have to tell you, it was so impactful. Um, I, we all literally sat back when you said that. And, um, and then we go back to that strategy meeting I was talking about we had two days ago and we were, um, as we often do and all groups do, what are we doing well? What can we do better? Um, we tend to be hard on ourselves and your comment came up as one of the things that we are doing well. And, um, but we hadn't articulated that as a group. We knew things were working, but we, it helped us so much that you would come in and note that and highlight it so that we understood why it was working. And I know for a lot of women, 
we don't know what works and what doesn't. So we tend to just put our head down and work doubly hard. Mm-hmm. Um, thinking and and it, it works, but we don't. That's not efficient, and we don't quite know what is working and not. So as a group, we want to thank you um, for for telling us that we. we you know, patted ourselves on the back a little bit and said, okay, that's great. We've got that down. And if we stray from that, um, you know, group dynamic, we'll, one of us will certainly bring us back, you know, you know to, to center us. There's so much talk these days about structural racism, structural sexism, structural classism, structural ableism. And it's causing us all to look around and say, what are some of the structures we need to change? And we're very aware of the structures that need to change now, but we're not often aware of how do we change it and what new structures do we want? So as women start to become aware of how, how are we doing power differently? Are we, you know, Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher said, be careful when fighting monsters, you don't become one. So how, when we get into positions of power, are we just becoming like the power structure we'd like to change? Because once you get into those structures, it's, and you wanna maintain, you wanna get a raise and you wanna be part of the leadership team, suddenly we slowly start becoming part of that structure. How do we change the structure? And one way is to pay attention the way you did in your group to, this feels different, this is working for us. And then to start to quantify and qualify it and write it down and turn it into, this is how we're doing power. And then it becomes a structure and it becomes something you can share and teach. Um, One thing that, that I was reminded of when you were saying this about doing power differently and, and not quite knowing what we're even doing is a science story, which has become real, even though it's just a story. And so a story I'd like to interrupt is this idea that under stress, all human beings fight or flight. Now, th- this was a um, based on a study or many studies done by a Harvard professor in the 1930s, Walter Cannon. And he was this brilliant social scientist who brought people into the lab at Harvard and studied, uh, measured their hormone secretion and other chemical secretions when he simulated stress in the lab. And, And person after person, when the stressful situation happened and they secreted these chemicals, it was either the fight aggression response or the, or the flight, and not just running away, but detaching, <clears throat> not connecting, no longer connecting, like detaching. So it's either flight or fight, fight or flight. And this became what we say. This is what people do under stress. We all say it. Oh, yeah, fight or flight. That's what we do under stress. Well, this wonderful woman, this professor, Dr. Um, Shelley Taylor at UCLA, in the year 2000 and all the way through 2007, decided with her team to look at those studies and she noticed something, only men had been studied. And back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way up until recently, only men were used in most medical and psychological studies that that was the only people being studied. She decided to replicate the studies with women She brought women into the lab. She also reviewed, she and her team reviewed a lot of the studies done on female animals. And um, she discovered that under stress, simulated stress, most of the women, that was not the major chemical and hormone that was released. There was some fight or flight, but mostly it was something she called tend and befriend. Under stress, the hormones released in women causes them to want to tend to the most vulnerable in the group, the children, the old people, the disabled people, and also to befriend as opposed to disconnecting or fleeing to create these circles of befriending. So you come home from work, you've had a really hard day. You don't just go get a beer and sit in front of the TV. 
you call your friend, you call six friends and you talk, talk, talk. Something women have been led to be ashamed of are talking and gossip and stuff. No, it's an amazing instinct that diffuses stress and aggression, befriending, creating circles of befriending, something we should be so proud that we do. And so um, this is why ways I think we can do power differently is to rely on our tend and befriend instincts. And if they have been suppressed, because we all have internalized patriarchy, men and women, to learn to be proud of that part of us that tends and befriends. I love that example. Um, and who knew that there were no women in the study? Like it didn't matter what half of the population would think or do. You know, I wanna to turn to a couple of questions um, that are in the chat. And there, this, there's, a, there's two here I, I, I love. Um, going back to Cassandra, the question is, I'm a man, and, and, and I'm glad that, that we have questions from men because we're talking about patriarchy as if it's the worst thing in the world. It just happens to be the dominant uh, you know, part of our society. Yeah. Um, it says, I am a man, uh, but I too identify with the limited understanding with the story of Cassandra. How do you see the idea of Cassandra's story crossing gender and racial lines of people who feel like their voices are not being heard? Beautiful question. Thank you so much. Um, we've all been hurt by patriarchy. Um, if by patriarchy, we, we mean exactly what you said, Lynn, um, the overemphasis of one part of the human experience. I mean, I have spent the last 30 years elevating the masculine in me or 40 years because I wanted to learn some of the aspects of masculinity, let's call it, that I love, that I love inside of me. Um, the ability to strategize, to ask for what I want, to go, to go, 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 you know, that sense of, of energy that's associated with the so-called masculine. But men can and should and must learn to love and validate the femaleness within them. You know how we say girls can be anything a boy can be. We tell our daughters, you can be anything a boy can be. But how many of us tell our sons, you can be anything a girl can be? Mm -hmm. and, to, and to say it with pride, you can be a caretaker, you can tend and befriend, you can um, be so attuned to the emotions and the needs of others that your instinct is to stop and do that and not only always to be looking at the bottom line. So um, the question of how can Cassandra's story be something that men and all other marginalized groups want to learn from is Cassandra's story is to trust what you know in your bones to be true, to trust it enough so that you find your voice and say it. How do we do that? A lot of times it involves psychotherapy. We've all been told to quiet our voices, not just women, but sensitive men, people of color. If you don't fit into the dominant reality, you think there's something wrong with you. You're ashamed of the part of you that doesn't want to fit in. So some of it just has to do with filtering out the voices and finding your own voice. It might sound easy, but it's not. It's, it's conditioning since the moment we were born whether it's your race or your sexuality or your gender. And so, you know, for me, another thing that has helped me a lot is the practice of meditation, which is really all about learning to listen quietly within and all those other voices, blah, 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 blah. Just welcoming them to leave the room, not aggressing on them, not making them wrong, letting all the stuff settle, 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 like dirt in a pond. And then this cool, clear water rises to the surface. And that's, that's where your still small voice is. 
And the more you let that voice speak to you, I know this sounds woo woo, but it's not. Science is backing it up. All the, the brain science that's telling us now our brain is elastic. You can carve new neural pathways your whole life. And meditation is a way to carve new pathways that give you strength and trust in your own voice. The, the other question that's come up, and this is one that was important to me as well, is given the impact of COVID and clearly women have borne the brunt of, of the pandemic in terms of dropping out of the workforce, trying to take care of the children, um, uncovering really the inequities within the home, um, uh, I think not causing them necessarily. But um, I, I loved in one of your TED talks, you, you said, you know, pain has something to be delivered. And, and I thought about that as, as uh, in, in the context of the pandemic, but what are your thoughts on, you know, the gender gap as it's taken such a hit so quickly? Is there a benefit that you can see or are we starting, you know, back years ago to, to, to uh, gain gender equity? Well, one of the benefits actually points to something that isn't a benefit. We have to stay vigilant. Women have to stay vigilant. Mm -hmm. When bad things like this happen, women's rights are often the first thing to go and history will bear mm -hmm. this out. And not just women's, but all marginalized societies, we have to stay vigilant. Vigilant doesn't mean like tense and angry all the time, sometimes. But vigilant just means being a grown up about this. Uh, Every thing that women have crawled our way into, into gaining over the past hundred years could be gone in a minute. And we are seeing it from this pandemic. And one of the reasons is because what our, what our society values, what it does not value the children the home and the first person, the, the people who have that instinct, the tend and befriend instinct, hey, somebody's got to take care of the kids here. There's no more school, there's no more daycare. Somebody has to stay home and take care of the kids. Well, because of our tend and befriend nature, we're like, okay, I guess I'll do it. And this is where what, what I feel needs to happen structurally is that the whole culture has to care intensely for the same things women have been caring about forever. We need universal preschool. We need parental leave. We need everyone, men and women and our, our, our leaders to care about things that matter just as much as the bottom line and industry and corporations. And that's why I feel an equal number of women in leadership is critical, not because all women are the same, but because most women and, and all the studies will bear this out in countries where there's um, parity of leadership. When women are equally represented women's issues, which should not be women's issues, they should be human issues, come to the forefront and policy begins to change. Right, right, exactly. And I think um, studies now show that the spending on women's issues, you know, are the benefit is seven to eight fold of, you know, the, the spending that is immediate, you know, that and, and we are programmed to think about what, is the, what are the quarterly results? What is going to result in higher sales or higher quarterly profits? And what you're suggesting is that we have to take the long view from a society's point of view. Um, and we've seen the impact of right now of not having done that, right. of, of prioritizing those. Um, we, we only have a few minutes left and, and I wanted to end if we could on the last part of your book, which I love because so often we, you know, we aspire uh, to, to these ideals and changes. And especially today, feeling overwhelmed 
um, individuals being overwhelmed with dealing with the pandemic and um, uh, you know um, sick loved ones and children it feels like we can't necessarily make a difference. And I really love that you give a bit of a roadmap on what individuals can do. You know, you said stay vigilant, but some examples of what we can do to remain vigilant and to press on. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my favorite things to do uh, is to connect with other women and I, I, I call this being romantic. You know, there are bromance movies. I, I want us to live in a romance movie, which is to have these amazing connections with women where we can, you know, you know how we're all like overwhelmed, many, many women are, some men, but most women with this idea of the imposter syndrome, how I don't belong, I don't know enough, I can't speak up, I can't ask for a raise, all the impostery feelings we have. It's so important to have strong female connections who can help us find our strength and find our voice and, and, and safe havens where we can um, strengthen ourselves. So that's, that's one thing that I think is important. And, and it also goes, flies in the face of uh, this idea that women don't support each other and women are catty and women, I have not found that in my life. Sure, every now and then there's women who are not supportive. Women are humans. But most, in most cases, if I intentionally go to create a supportive group of friends and colleagues who are women to help me find my voice, it works. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you end on that note of women supporting other women. Um, and I, we have to end here. It, an hour doesn't begin to touch upon the depth of, of your book, Elizabeth. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to, to read it. Um, it's, and, and speaking of that, we do have a winner of the raffle and it is uh, LaRuth McAfee. So uh, LaRuth, we will reach out to you and we will make those arrangements. Um, but Elizabeth, thank you so much for your advice and uh, your encouragement, your perspective. Um, it, it feels to me that at your very core, you are an optimist and I love that. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, and so um, we will wrap this, uh, wrap this up now. And I'd like to just say a few words in parting. Um, these are upcoming webinars. And if you haven't registered, please do. I think that they will be absolutely amazing. Um, and in the meantime, I hope that you will join us and that you will connect with us through, through social media. A special thanks again to our sponsors. We are truly grateful uh, for them. And just a note about our next um, webinar, it will be in three weeks with Rinku Sen, who is the co-founder, excuse me, the co-president of the board of directors of the Women's March. And we are really looking forward to that. Um, so uh, I hope to see you back here in uh, three weeks. Thank you for joining and have a great day, everyone. <laughs>